Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. In this dissection, we will be considering some aspects of the cutaneous innervation of the head, mainly those of the facial region, which are supplied then by the trigeminal nerve and its various divisions. Least we forget, however, there are other cutaneous supplies to the head region. One of them, which is adjoining the facial region, is shown here, and that is the great auricular nerve will send a branch not only to the area of the ear, but also frequently have a branch passing over to the angle of the mandible. To locate various branches of the trigeminal divisions, I'd like to show you some techniques which I think will help you. We'll concentrate first on the ophthalmic division, and I'll show you how that's done at this point. In exposing any nerve which comes through a bony foramen, one way in which to do this is to peel back the periosteum from the bone and watch for the nerve as it exits its foramen. Now, if you peel the scalp back and we look for the supraorbital nerve, you can peel with your uh, probe the periosteum away and as you pull this back you will find that in this region one can expose the supraorbital nerve as you see it here as it is extending out from the periosteum and in fact if we work along further we can see a perhaps larger branch at this point. It is covered by periosteum and you will need to reflect the periosteum away from the nerve to get a true identification of it as being nerve tissue. Once you've found it this way, we can replace the muscle and follow the branches on the face as they distribute to the skin. Another branch of the ophthalmic division which exits through a bony foramen that is somewhat hard to locate can be located near the orbit. If we look in this region, we have here the area of the orbicularis oculi muscle. One can palpate the underlying zygoma, and if you reflect the orbicularis oculi to the side, this is done with some dissection, obviously. This has been pre-dissected. One can palpate the inferior lateral margin of the orbit. If that is done, you can then get an extent of the zygoma identified in this fashion. Once that has been done, if you will incise along the distal margin of the zygoma, across the periosteum to the lateral margin of the orbit, one can lay a flap, periosteal in nature, which can be rolled back in this fashion and again, dissect your way down until you find a nerve which is going to penetrate bone and come out into the periosteum. Here, for example, is the zygomatical facial nerve. Another nerve, which is somewhat difficult to locate, of the ophthalmic division is located near the nose. In this region, again, we're looking down on their specimen, um, we can notice the nasal bone coming out here. The nasal bone is joined by the lateral nasal cartilage and at the interface of the cartilage junction with bone one can locate the external nasal nerve and here it is here at this point. It again exits the junction between the bone and cartilage to come onto the face. It is deep to bone and superficial to cartilage. Now with another head, I'd like to consider then the aspect of the maxillary division. Here you have already seen a portion of that nerve trunk as it exits. 
its major distribution that we want to consider now is the infraorbital nerve, which is going to rise on the face in this region. Now, if we look in this area, we'll see that we have the levator labi superioris here. If you can cut and reflect that then from its bony attachment, one can lay it to the side in this fashion. Once this is out of the way, then you need only to work down against the bone and locate the infraorbital foramen. Exiting from it is a spray of nerves, which have been nicely worked out here, and an accompanying artery. Follow the branches of this nerve to determine its distribution, not only to the oral region, but to the lateral nasal and inferior lid. The mandibular division is going to have two major branches that appear on the face, which are best shown on this other head. The area again of the chin is familiar to you. We've worked with the facial muscles, and here is one that is going to have to be reflected to show the mental nerve, which is going to pass out deep to this muscle. If you incise the depressor anguli oris and reflect it from its region of attachment, one can discover beneath it then the area for the inferior alveolar nerve. Now the inferior alveolar nerve in this particular specimen is very interesting because we've had extreme resorption of this mandibular base. In fact, the entire height of the mandible is shown between these two points of the forceps. But still, we can identify features then of the mental nerve. Here's one, and here's associated with it the inferior alveolar artery with its branch passing out into the tissue in this region. This then is the mental nerve, a branch of the mandibular division of the trigeminal, which supplies the region of the chin. The final branch that I'd like to consider of the mandibular division is associated with a, an area of the buccinator, which is located here, the anterior margin of the masseter muscle, which is located here, and a fat pad, which is mechanical in nature, which we'd like you to consider in this dissection. It's necessary to remove the fat pad to adequately demonstrate the nerve. To do that, we have here the masseter parotid duct. We'll reflect the parotid duct. Beneath it is the buccal fat pad. In reflecting that region or that pad, we want to reach beneath the pad and free it up from its deep extensions. This is only its superficial lobe. If we remove this fat pad and pull it out, we uncover a large area a hole, and this is what that fat pad was doing. It was moving in and out of this region. But here you have the anterior border of masseter, and you'll notice deep in this region the tendon of another muscle of mastication, the area of the temporalis. Now, between the temporalis muscle and the buccinator muscle, which is lying here to the medial, we are going to have a fascia which one can see coming across in this region, connecting the buccinator to the temporalis, deep tendon. It is called the temporal buccal fascia. It's interesting because it acts then as a bridge beneath which is going to pass a nerve that we want to find at this point. That nerve then is the buccal nerve. And if we look in here, we should be able to find it. Here's the branch coming down at this point. No, I stand corrected. Here it is right here. I had a small portion of the fascia associated with the temporalis. But this nerve is here. That's the buccal nerve. It is closely associated with this fascial tract. It is the last point at which it can be easily located for anesthetic position, positioning of the needle for blocking this nerve.
That completes then our consideration of the cutaneous innervation and the buccal fat pad. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu/license.